Good morning. Good to see good to see each of you here this morning. We're gonna go ahead and get started. So uh, we'll open in a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of worshiping and praising your name. Oh, we thank you for the joy to gather together in this beautiful morning. And Lord, I ask that you would purify our hearts before you and that uh, that we might worship you with a whole heart and, uh, Lord if there is any any unconfessed sin or any uh, uh, anything that needs to be addressed Lord may it be addressed right now so that our worship might be uh, uh, as you have asked Lord that it comes from a, a pure heart not a divided heart and we ask this in Jesus name Amen We're so glad you could join us for worship. We're going to continue. We're going to uh, continue our worship this morning, and we're going to sing a few hymns uh, this morning. Um, Malachi picked the songs for the service, so I, I hope you're okay with that. Uh, if not, you can complain to him later, and I'm sure he'll take it just fine. But we're going to start with a good old favorite: uh, Jesus paid it all. Jesus died my soul. 
So this next song is a brand new one, uh, actually written by a young man uh, who served over at Crossroads as their, mu as their music and worship leader for a couple of years. Um, uh, so uh, his name's Andrew R Romanowitz, and an interesting, interesting little connection. When Andrew was uh, in grade school, his mom brought him to my dad's church um, and at the time, uh, Rachel and I were uh, in charge of the youth group, so we didn't get to spend much time with him, but we saw him running around church as a little boy. Now he's serving over at Crossroads as the uh, music and worship leader, and uh, he wrote this song, and uh, so Malachi is going to teach it to us this morning. Brokenness to lingers when the hour of loneliness is long. I will stand upon your sworn intentions and I will praise your promise with a song. I will say goodness. I will say mercy, surely your love, O oh God, has followed me. Even here, the sorrows all around me, still your love is more So I will trust the hands that bled forgiveness. And I will trust the heart that bore the cross. I will say goodness. I will say mercy. Surely your love, oh God. Has followed me only goodness, perfect joy you have in store all my fountains, all my goodness. Soon I'll see no more by faith than only goodness from the first was in your ways. I will say goodness, I will say mercy. Surely your love, O oh God, has followed me. So good, good message, huh? Good song. Uh, since most of you have never heard it before, I think we should probably sing it one more time. You might have a chance of singing along with as opposed to humming something. So let's try the whole song one more time. And uh, see if you get an opportunity to sing it this time, a second time through. When the ache of brokenness still lingers, when the hour of loneliness is long, I will stand upon your sworn intention. I will praise your promise with a song. I will say goodness. I will say mercy. Surely. 
sing with isn't it a good song good song we're gonna fin we're gonna finish with um a well-known newer song called Ten Thousand reasons uh commonly known as bless the lord oh my soul um so great great use of scripture in uh in song here bless the lord
At least we know that uh, Dad Dad's loved. <laughs> it's a very good thing. Well, thank the Lord we get to worship together. Amen. 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 And uh, it's just a wee bit warm in the sun, very nice in the shade, but all in all, a beautiful day to worship together. So, a lot to be thankful for. And I'm thankful I get to be with you guys. I'm not sure if you're thankful to be with me or not, but I'm thankful to be with you. So uh, thank the Lord for that. And uh, thank God for the wonderful uh, worship uh, uh, team group, we're going to call it, uh, that's serving together up here. Um, it's, it's really an, an, open, an open group. So if anybody is like, oh, I'd like, to, I'd like to help out, there's no problem. We will stick you behind the tree, and you're welcome to join us anytime. No, seriously, if anybody wants to, you're more than welcome to. Uh, well, we are going to take a moment here for our offering this morning. And I do want to thank the many of you that uh, faithfully support First Baptist Church. Uh, if you're visiting with us, either in person or online, uh, we do not want you to feel obligated to give in the offering. Um, but if you ever forget to give your gift in person, or maybe you're just watching online and you'd like to uh, give, you can give through the uh, website as well. Let's uh, have a word of prayer before the offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of worshiping and praising the, the name of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Oh, we ask your blessing on our time together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we look ahead to this coming week, um, we are planning to have a Change Your Oil event this Saturday, this coming Saturday from 8 to 11. Um, so far, the, re the response that we've asked for about people being interested has been anemic. We might even go so far as to say nothing. Uh, I'm not saying nothing, I'm saying we could say nothing. <laughs> But there's uh, uh, so if, if you know anybody who'd be interested or maybe you uh, would, would appreciate the assistance for yourself, um, then by all means, please uh, let me know. Let Matt know. We, we'd like to have a schedule if at all possible. If, and if you know anybody that would benefit from it, just let them know. Um, honestly, even if it's the day of, if someone shows up and they want help and they don't have anything, 
Matt or I won, we'll happily run to the store and and get what's needed. Okay, so this isn't, we're not trying to cut anybody out here. We're just trying to get, get a little bit clarity going into the set into Saturday. So, and if I, I was talking to Matt this morning, if nobody shows up, then a handful of men and a couple of women will have a nice time fellowshipping and chatting and waiting for cars to show up. And that couldn't, could be a worst case scenario. You know. Thank you. Thank you. It's my sun allergy popping out. So, um, I don't know that I'm missing any announcements this morning. Um, let's see, am I missing anything announcement-wise that I should be? No? Nothing? Okay. Um, so, coming up, on Sunday, be two weeks from now, I believe. I think it's two weeks from now. Uh, we're going to have a, a guest in this morning. Many of you know Don Shire. Um, and in a couple weeks, he will be visiting with us. Um, so I'm sure that in the worship time, we will enjoy the added benefit of his uh, trumpet playing with us. Um, and uh, that his uh, message and presentation will be a real blessing, I'm sure. All right, nobody's flagging me down for missed announcements, so I'm going to move on from those and uh, take some time for prayer this morning and uh, just have a, a special request to keep in mind this week. Um, it's this Friday that, uh, that Dee and Betsy find out the court's decision on the kids, so um, a lot to be hopeful for and... Uh, just, you know, a little bit of concern um, along the way. So let's keep uh, keep uh, Dee and Betsy and these kids in prayer this week. Um, if you have a moment just to reach out via phone call or text and pray with them, I'm sure that would be appreciated. Uh, so I didn't bother asking Dee. I'm sorry. I'm just assuming you'd be okay with that. All right, let's see. Any other uh, praises or prayer requests this morning? I want to share a praise. Um, my grandfather's memorial on Friday went very well. Um, so thanks for those of you that, that prayed for that. Um, it was a blessing. And, uh, you know, the hardest part for me wasn't the memorial. No, the hardest part for me was going through Grandpa's stuff that, that uh, was left over for the grandkids to pick through. That was the hardest part for me. But um, the, the memorial was a wonderful time, and uh, a couple families uh, from church showed up, so thanks for those that did. It was nice to see you there. Any other praises or prayer requests this morning? Steve? Yes, sir. is his name. Bill was just recently diagnosed with cancer, having to undergo everything that goes along with the treatment, surgery, chemo, you know. He's, he and his poor wife, Dottie, he, I think they probably all have had some experience going through these troubled times. And uh, I was thinking about, uh, why do I even want to mention about Bill down in Florida, you know, having to undergo this? But this is what the body is all about. And I really became aware of it probably about 50 years ago here at this church when I was diagnosed with a degree of cancer too. 
first as a young man of 30 years old, it just upset my whole world. You know, I said, oh boy, I got a wife and children at home. How am I going to deal with it, etc., etc." And there was a dear lady here at a Bible study in her time we had, and uh, Jenny Williams, which a lot of you don't know who that was. And uh, Jenny said, well, don't worry about it, Frazier. She says, there's people out in California praying for you. Well, I don't know, that just hit me like a ton of bricks, being a young Christian, you know, that God would know about me out in California and praying for me. And uh, sure enough, the prayers did work, because I'm here today, I do believe, because of prayers that went up. So our prayers do mean something. They mean something. Look how God has worked in our lives and changed our hearts to call upon him. Uh, the world out there, they say, well, that's just tough luck. That's the way life goes, you know, hope you get better, such as that. But uh, we, we have a select group here, God's children, and we're going to be praying for people. And it's going to make a difference. It does make a difference. And God is pleased with us that we take the thought and the time to remember those that are in need, you know? Uh, old movie, uh, uh, Boys Town or something like that, Mickey Rooney carrying the little tyke, and he said, he's not heavy, he's my brother, you know? So we got to take time and pray for those that are in uh, not the best of condition today, and thank God for what we have. And you know, why am I moved? I'm sitting out here looking at this. I want you to just look at that beautiful blue sky. Have you ever seen a blue one that's more beautiful than that? It's just beautiful. And those white clouds up there. It's just, you know, it got in the green bean field. I'm just starting to notice it's starting to change out there a little bit. So I'm it. There's a season for everything. Thank you. Any other praises or prayer requests this morning? My cousin Carly and her dancer and all of her kids and her husband going through a hard time. And my grandma, she is 100% with it. And she is getting pushed by some of her children to go into a nursing home, even though it's not needed. They have they have their selfish reasons, and it's really putting my grandma in a hard place, and it really hurts the rest of us. Family. Now we'll keep her in prayer. Absolutely. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Um, education. I'd like prayer for students to be able to learn uh, how to this year and for the parents that are working and trying to pull this off uh, to still be some wonderful uh, information for you to learn. Yeah, so keep prayer, keep uh, parents in prayer for their uh, home education of their kids this year. Um, needed for a lot of families for that prayer, absolutely. Any other praises or prayer requests this morning? Dave. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, my dad recently was in uh, a CT scan, and what he went, actually went in for it turned out to be not an issue at all. But thankfully, they found a uh, heart aneurysm, you know, and uh, now they can at least. 
see snow to deal with it. So, you know, I just, we just ask for prayers going forward that, you know, we'll be able to figure out what to do for him. Or, you know, really thankful that, that you found it by accident, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank God for that. Any others? Well, let's take a few moments here for prayer. Oh, did I miss one? Oh, I'm sorry, Patty. No, it's okay. You were hiding behind Philip. I was debating, but, you know, I just feel the Lord, the Holy Spirit prompted me to say something. I just pray that he'll send the Holy Spirit upon our our great country. I'm really disturbed by all of these evil marauders who are looting and destroying our cities. And I just pray for the hand of God to come upon our nation and to calm all of this mass chaos and evil protesting that we see. This is not, this is not of God. This is evil what we're seeing displayed throughout our nation. And I just pray that he'll send us Holy Spirit and hopefully bring us all into salvation, that this will be in some way used for good. Yes. Well, the, the light, of, of, the, of, the light of, the, of Christ shines brightest in the darkest places. Amen. But yes, we should definitely pray for the, God, the Holy Spirit to bring radical change to our country. All right, well, let's take a few moments here for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of lifting up these burdens and some of these praises before you this morning. I do want to lift up uh, Bill Thomas and the cancer that he's dealing with. Lord, that we, we thank you as Fraser reminded us, that we can partner with your body, whether here locally or around the country or the world. And Lord, that the, the, the best way that we can care for your body is, is, is first through prayer. So we do want to lift up Bill and ask that you would provide healing for him and that you would be with Linda as they walk together through this challenging time. We also would like to lift up... Uh, Carly and the, uh, the cancer that she's dealing with, ask that you'd provide healing for her and an abundance of grace for her husband and her kids. Lord, for uh, Phil's grandmother, um, as uh, Lord, she's being pushed into, into things that she would not prefer to do, ask that you just give her an abundance of peace in her spirit. Um, and Lord, give her the confidence she needs at the right times to be able to... Uh, uh, communicate clearly uh, what she wants. Lord, for um, uh, Tom Heimers, Chris's dad, uh, Lord, thank you that uh, that you revealed this um, heart aneurysm and that you would give uh, clarity for treatment um, and even for the uh, opportunity just to uh, eventually remove it, Lord, as you see fit. Lord, as Patty asked for prayer for our country, we do want to lift up our country and ask that you would just pour out your Holy Spirit that the hearts of, of, of men and women might be convicted of sin and they might turn from that sin to trust you as Lord and Savior. Lord, as uh, Betsy asked for prayer for the kids who are being uh, educated at home, or that you just uh, provide an abundance of grace for these parents, uh, some that are in this church, but Lord, many, many outside of it, um, or that they would have an abundance of grace, and that, uh, um, or that through this you would give uh, parents the uh, opportunity and privilege to have greater influence on their children's lives. We also would like to lift up um, uh, Dick and uh, Pat and Dan and Linda before you, or that you'd be with each of them in this very painful time of separation from their spouse. Um, Lord, because of the COVID restrictions, uh, that you would give them grace and peace as they are going. 
Lord, for John and Zenoa and the trial that they are facing, that you would uh, continue to strengthen them. Um, and Lord, we do want to lift up uh, Dee and Betsy and these uh, children and this court date this week. I ask that you would work in a powerful way um, and that we would be able to uh, rejoice with your answer uh, by faith. Well, we also would like to um, lift up our nation's leaders and ask that they would submit to you as Lord and Savior. They would recognize there is a God in heaven, and Lord, that they are simply um, under delegated authority. Lord, for the salvation of our family and friends, Lord, we ask that you'd work in their hearts and lives and draw them to you. They might trust you and know you as Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Kids, if you would like to go to Children's Church, now is a good time to uh, run away. And many thanks to uh, uh, Kelsey and Lisa for uh, coordinating and running this. Although I've got, I'm going to tell you, I, I, may, I may occasionally miss the one screaming for Dada, you know. Although it looks like Bug is still here, so I think we'll be okay. So we just finished up looking at the book of Ephesians on unity in the body. And this week we're going to start a short series on the book of 1 Peter. Um, looking at unity, unity through persecution and trial. Now, some of you may already know this, but for the rest of you that either forgot or don't know, the, the book of 1 Peter was written by the Apostle Peter. It was uh, written to the first century church, and it's addressed specifically to a group of people that have been chased away from their homes. Um, now, if you remember the Apostle Paul, before he became a believer, he was doing unspeakable things to Christians. He was, he was lying about them so they would go to jail. He was lying about them so they would be killed. Uh, he, was, he took pride and pleasure in chasing them out of their homes and ridding the nation of Israel of this um, um, un, I guess horrible disease of Christians. Well, the Apostle Paul, during his tenure at that in that position, was the tip of the spear for the Sanhedrin. But don't think for one moment that just because he trusted Christ as Lord and Savior that no one stepped up to replace him. Just because he came to know the Lord and stop doing what he was doing. There were still wicked, ungodly men behind him funding this effort. So, of course, somebody else stepped up to continue that process. And so thousands and thousands of believers were literally chased from their homes for fear of their life or for fear of their family's life being completely ruined. So it's one of those, you take what you can grab as you're on your way out, you have maybe hours of notice, and you just travel until you find a spot that you hope to settle. Now put yourself in their shoes for a moment. You come to know Christ, you're trusting Him as Lord and Savior, and simply because of that fact, you, you are literally running with what you can carry on your back. Or for some of the more wealthy believers, whatever they could carry on their horse. But, you know, if you're a wealthy believer, you have a lot more than your horse can carry. So let's not, you know. Um, so it was not a fun time for believers. It was not an exciting time to be a Christian. 
Right? The coffers of the churches were not full of money. As a matter of fact, the churches were full of hurting and ma many penniless believers working hard to support their families, but literally trusting God for their daily bread. And that's not an exaggeration. So it was into this culture that the book of 1 Peter was written. So if you take your Bibles and open me to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 4, we're going to read a few verses this morning. You know, one of my greatest fears is going to open the scriptures while I'm preaching and not finding the book that I'm looking for when you know it's there, but you just keep flipping right by it. There's been a couple times that I've sung the Bible, the Bible memory, it's the Bible book memory song through my head as I'm preaching to make sure I get to the right book. But you go to the book of 1 Peter, and we're going to be in chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 1 through 6. Therefore, since Christ, Christ suffered in the flesh, equip yourselves also with the same resolve, because the one who suffered in the flesh has finished with sin, in order to live the remaining time in the flesh no longer for human desires, but for God's will. For there has already been enough time spent in doing what the pagans choose to do, carrying on in unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and lawless idol idolatry. So they are surprised that you don't plunge with them into the same flood of wild living, and they slander you. They will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason the gospel was also preached to those who are now dead, so that although they might be judged by men in the fleshly realm, they might live by God in the spiritual realm. So this, this opening part here about Christ suffering in the flesh. Since Christ suffered in the flesh. So then that begs the question then, how did Christ suffer in the flesh? How did he suffer in the flesh? Well, Hebrews says that he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. Verse of chapter 2 uh, of Hebrews in verse 17, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every way, so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tested and has suffered, he is able to help those who are tested. Now, most people are aware that Christ was tempted by Satan, that he visited Christ and tempted him, right, with three temptations. Uh, most people are aware that Christ suffered on the cross and that he suffered before dying on the cross. But not many, even believers, think about the suffering that Christ went through on a daily basis being misunderstood by all around him. Right? If you think you have mental suffering because nobody understands you, multiply it times 10, and Christ, now you're close to the Christ, the, the, the type of misunderstanding that the Messiah had. Even the people who claim to be, excuse me, claim to be his closest friends and the people who stood by him through almost everything still did not understand him. As a matter of fact, the understanding, uh, 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 the lack of understanding was so severe that when they finally realized he was prophesying about his death, which by the way, they realized it within weeks of his death, that it was shortly after that understanding that James and John brought their mother before Jesus so that their mother could ask that each one of them would sit on his right and left hand. Now talk about a gross misunderstanding. What they were saying was, we will follow you until you die, but when you die, we want to be in the position to assume that power. They were still thinking of an earthly kingdom, and they were still thinking about succession to the throne of this Messiah.
when Jesus fed the 5,000 and the crowd followed him across the sea. Remember we referenced this a couple weeks ago? I think it was last week and a few weeks before that. That what the crowd did what? They went and found him and, and Jesus told the crowd, you're here for the free food. Now he taught them many things about God's word, but they couldn't have cared less. But free food? Where? I'll take a half day's walk for some free food. So when, the, when it talks about the Messiah's suffering, it wasn't just the suffering that he is famous for, it was also the daily suffering that we don't often think about. Did you know that, the, that Christ's family came to have an intervention with him? Mark talks about how they, they came to pull him out of the crowd and take him home. And that was where Christ said, he looked at the crowd because the word came in. The house was so packed, his family couldn't get in to, to take him out. They were coming to take him by force, to remove him and stop him from embarrassing the family. And they were coming to take him by force. And the crowd was so thick, they couldn't get in. So they passed word in through the crowd. And the, and the, the crowd said, hey, your family's here for you. But it wasn't just they're here to talk to you. It was they need to see you now. And Jesus, knowing the intent of his family, looked around at the crowd and said, Who is my father and my mother and my brethren? Is it not those who do the will of God? He suffered family rejection through misunderstanding of his purpose and his call. The family decided, as a group, it'd be better to shut this guy up than to keep the family from having to answer all these embarrassing questions about why he's doing this and why is he saying that and why is he making such a big stink. So when Hebrews said he had to suffer like his brothers in every way so that he could, could, be, could become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service to God, he didn't just suffer the pain that we're aware of. He also suffered relational and emotional damage that we don't often think about. But I also want to mention another type of suffering. If you'll look with me at Isaiah 53 and verse 4, the scripture says, Yet he himself bore our sickness and he carried our pains, but in turn we regard, regarded him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities, Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. Now, this is a very interesting connection of Scripture here, and I want you to follow this with me. Where was our sin taken? You know the answer to this. Where, where did Christ take our sin? Where was it prophesied that he would take our sin? On a cross, right? It was cursed as everyone who hangs on a tree. That was the curse. He became the curse for us, right? So if he took our sin on the cross where the, where the father turned his back on the son because the sin of the world was laid on him on the cross, then why did he have to suffer the beating and rejection that came before? The sin wasn't taken on him in the beating and the rejection. It was not a progressive buildup of sin being taken. The sin was taken on the cross where he became the curse. So then why did he go through all of that leading up to becoming the curse? He could have just hung on the cross and been the curse. Hebrews 4, 15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness. You see, Isaiah says, 
The punishment for our peace was on him, and his wounds bring us healing. Do you know why you can go to the Messiah in the midst of your great pain and suffering? It's because you know that he understands your pain and suffering. Your sin could have been paid for apart from the pain and suffering, but you would not understand the merciful nature of your high priest apart from his pain and suffering. So let's look at this again in 1 Peter 4. Since Christ suffered in the flesh, because you know what he went through on your account, since he suffered in the flesh, equip yourselves with the same resolve. God's not asking you to do anything that hasn't already been demonstrated for you. He's simply saying, follow me. You know, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, if they have treated me this way, they will treat you the same way. He said, the disciple is not greater than his master. So if Christ suffered rejection and misunderstanding and physical abuse and emotional and mental abuse, because of choosing to honor God, then what makes you think that that's not going to happen to you just because you're a Christian? Jesus said, expect it. In the early church, they lived with actually being forced from their homes. So we are to equip ourselves with the same resolve because the one who has suffered in the flesh has finished with sin in order to live the remaining time in the flesh no longer for human desires but for God's will. This is not some ultra-complicated theology here. This is actually quite simple. If you suffer willingly because you're choosing to honor and love the Messiah, why would you go back after that to choosing the things that the Messiah was against? If you suffered for the Messiah, you're going to continue choosing the Messiah. Especially if it was willful suffering. For there has already been enough time spent in doing what the pagans choose to do. In carrying on an unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and lawless idolatry. So there's already been enough time spent in that. But remember this, what happens here? He says, and they are surprised that you don't plunge with them into the same flood of wild living, and they slander you. Now, before we get all up in arms about the pagans here, okay, let's, let's just recognize what, what um, Peter is dealing with. People who've been uprooted from their homes, gone into foreign lands where nobody knows them, and started working and trusting God to support their families. Now, if you've lived in the world, there are people in the world who don't know the Lord, who have no interest in the Lord, but they're nice people to be around. They've got a nice nature to them. They're not, they're not, they don't think that they're out to cause you harm, right? This is just normal. You're, anywhere in the world, you're going to find lots of these people. And those nice people, when you come and you're new and they don't know you and they hear your sad story, they think they're doing you a favor by inviting you to join their lifestyle. They think that they're welcoming you by asking you to sin with them. Now, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, then maybe you haven't worked out in the world long enough. This is just normal human behavior. And when you reject that offer, by your rejection of the offer, you are saying to them that there is sin in your life and I'm not willing to participate in it. And so, of course, in, in their pride and in their arrogance and in their already rejection of God, 
They're surprised that you don't plunge with them into the same flood of wild living because they've already justified it. And of course they're going to slander you because you make them feel guilty about their sin and you're not jumping in and joining with them. Here they were being nice and polite and extending to you a courtesy to invite you. And when you say no, they feel deeply offended. Well, guess what? That was normal back in Peter's day with the dispersed believers and it's normal in our day even without dispersed believers. And he says, they will give an account. So don't be worried about judging them. Don't, don't be anxious about what's fair and what's not fair. They will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. And here's this reason. The gospel was also preached to those who are now dead. So, for this reason, because they're going to give an account, you're preaching the gospel and the gospel was already preached to those who are now dead so that, so that although they might be judged by men in the fleshly realm, they might live by God in the spiritual realm. When you have been chased from your home and watched your friends killed for their faith in the Lord, you start to wonder where the justice is in the world start to wonder, is God actually in control of this mess, of this hot mess? Well, they might be judged by men in the fleshly realm. They're, they're, they're going to live by God in the spiritual realm. So don't put your hope and your faith and all of your betting on the fleshly realm. Now, how does, this, how does this impact you and I today? Well, sometimes it's, a, it's, it's fearful even to know what to say to people who don't agree with you. Sometimes it's fearful just to go outside or to make a trip because you don't know what's going to happen. And, and, then, and, and here's, the, here's the reality. When God puts you in a situation because you're choosing to follow Him, what have you left to fear? Angry men who might kill you? I'm not saying that we shouldn't have a level of caution as we're going. I think we should be wise and we should exercise caution. So I'm not saying throw caution to the wind. but. Whether you die from ripe old age and because you're, you know, your internal parts are failing or whether you die while you're young because of a disease or whether you die because somebody is causing that death, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Should we fear what's coming? Should we be fearful of what God has called us to do? So then that begs the, the big question then, what has God called us to do? Well, and that's why we're looking at Scripture here. We're looking at unity in the body. God has called us to unity. God has called us to the gospel. God has called us to make disciples to follow the Messiah. God has called us to remain faithful through suffering, to have the same resolve that the Messiah had. These are the important things that God has called us to do. He's called us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. He's called us to love him with all our heart, soul, and mind. And honestly, just thinking about all of those things should be more than enough to give you a brain cramp. Once again, I, I said before, I think it, it's, it's appropriate to go through life with caution and to be wise. So I'm in favor of, of having a cautious moving forward 
and asking God for wisdom as we're going. Well, let me share some things God has not called us to. God has not called us to, to change our country through electing the right people. God has not called them to be the salt and light. He's called you to be the salt and light. You can't expect somebody who's willing and not willing to lie through their eye teeth just to get your vote to be the salt and light. And I'm referring to every single politician in the country here. There's not a single one of them, Christian or non-Christian, who is who has not lied through their eye teeth. Doesn't mean that they don't, maybe not intend on doing it, but they know in their heart, it ain't going to happen. I'll do my best, but it ain't going to happen. We're not called to change our country through an election. We are called to be the salt and light. God has not called us to change our country through wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. We can draw principles from Scripture on all of these things, but that is not God's primary call. God has not called us to change our country through being vigilantes and for helping, you know, you know uh, protecting, going out and trying to protect people who don't want to be protected. <laughs> now, there's so many things that we get distracted by because I feel like there's a level of control for me in the distraction. Right? I can control whether or not I have a mask on or whether or not I don't. I can control whether or not I'm stepping in to help somebody or not. I can control who I vote for. And I can put my hope in these things that I'm doing, but there's no lasting hope in any of those things. And God has not called us to these things. He's called us to His picture, His hope. Oh yeah, one more thing that God has not called us to and I, I hope I'm not hurting anybody's feelings with this. I may have already, but God has not called us to education. He's called us to righteousness. Right? We, we joke about certain things like cleanliness is next to godliness, which for my wife is almost not a joke. But um, we, we, we laugh at that because we know it's not entirely true. Okay? It's just it's a funny way of saying be clean. But you know what? Education is not next to godliness. Did you know that most of the highest educated people are the most fierce God haters? Did you know that education, educated people don't value God's opinion? They value other people's opinions. And they don't value your opinion unless you can quote those same other people that they're quoting. Education is not sinful. Education can be very positive, but it is not godliness. God has called us to follow Him with the same resolve that the Messiah had. And our hope is in the Messiah that we follow so dearly because we know that he understands us in the middle of our suffering. <laughs> Next week we're going to look at where the Peter says the end of all things is near. Therefore, be serious and disciplined for prayer. I hate to be discouraging, but that was written about almost 2,000 years ago. So whether the end was near then or whether the end is near now, I can't tell you. But regardless of whether it's coming in the next couple of years or it's coming in 2,000 more years, we are still supposed to be serious and disciplined for prayer.
And we'll look at that some more next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the power of your truth this morning. Lord, we ask that you would continue to use your word to challenge the way that we think about life and godliness. Oh, we thank, we're thankful that your word is the hope that we have to renew our minds. That we might prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Lord, give us the faith that we need to trust your word as we are going. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to close with a well-known favorite. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. There's a lot of blind people in this world, and what you're seeing from them is the evidence that they're blind, and they need hope, the amazing hope of the Messiah. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but able to keep you from falling and to present you spotless before the throne to the only wise God be power and honor and glory and dominion both now and forevermore in whose name we pray amen God bless you go in peace